So Priya, you want Yeah. Hello? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, uh, whether online or in person. So we're excited to be celebrating World Wetlands Day today. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Uh, please keep all questions till afterwards since we have a series of lightning talks. So we're trying to keep the pace going and not get bogged down with questions and answers in between. So we'll have tea break afterwards. Feel free to ask any questions at that time. And uh, we'll get started. Uh, I'll give it to Dr. Jamwal. Thank you, Priya. And first of all, uh... Uh, I welcome everybody for this particular event on World Wetlands Day and a special thanks to Priya and to Ravikant for coming up with this idea and helping me organize this particular event. So thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll start. Uh, so before we jump into the lightning talks, I would like to quickly. Uh, so before we jump into the lightning talks, I will just quickly um, walk you through what what. Uh, like, you know, what are wetlands, why they are important, and why do we want to restore? Just setting up the context for all the lightning talks so that, like, you know, we can just come back and relate to, like, you know, why we are doing the stuff which we are doing here at ATRI. So, so World Wetland Day is celebrated every year on 2nd February, and uh, uh, it, uh, the, so this particular day, 2nd February, it marks the adoption of Ramsar Convention where all parties met in 1971 for protection of these uh, fragile ecosystem. So what are wetlands? So wetlands are the land areas which are saturated with water either throughout the year or seasonally. So there are different types of wetlands, uh, inlet wetlands, which are the examples are like marshes, lakes, swamps, Flood plains, Bangalore lakes itself are, comes into this particular category of inland wetlands. Again, they are human-made inland inland wetlands. Um, so, uh, coastal wet. We also have a category called coastal wetlands, where we have uh, saltwater marshes, estuaries, mangroves, lagoons, coral reefs, also categorized as wetlands. In addition to that, fish ponds, uh, irrigation tanks are also categorized as wetlands. Cons uh, <coughs> So why are wetlands important? Like, you know, why are we talking about wetlands? So wetlands provide multiple, multiple benefits. First of all, we all know that 1% of the total fresh water available is available for human beings. Out of that, 30% is provided by the, these wetlands. So uh, these wetlands, either they can directly use for, can be directly used for surface water, for drinking water source, or indirectly they recharge groundwater and provide Fresh, fresh water for drinking. They are also biodiversity hotspots. They support a vast like, you know, species of flora and fauna. So they provide very critical habitats for different types of flora and fauna, provide livelihoods to 1 billion people and feed 3 billion people. Now, this is the data I have gotten for I, from IUCN. So, yeah, and it also helps with coping with uh, storms and uh, flooding. And in addition to that, they also sequester carbon. Again, the peat is not, which is very much of a, here in India, but when you go to Europe and all peatland, basically they, can, they cover 3% of the surface area, but end up sequestering 30% of the carbon. And uh, we also have coastal water, uh, mangroves, which sequester st and store carbon 55 times faster than the rain fed, uh, sorry, rain forests. So you can imagine how important these wetlands are. So <clears throat> then, 
why we need to restore so of course because they provide so many benefits ecosystem services to human these wetlands need to be restored and this is the time now is the time why because since 1970 uh, 70 35 percent of the wetlands have been either degraded or have been like you know um uh, destroyed or being lost and most of the the the, the drivers are because of the human uh, activities which is driving degradation you can find these kind of examples in bank for bangalore lakes as well so uh, you can see like you know there is uh, untreated wastewater going in and because of that you see a lot of wetlands either converting into like you know dry lands there is a lot of diversion happening in in bangalore so and we see like you know how the construction of like you know construction is coming up and which is basically uh, we are basically losing these uh, crucial uh, wetlands. Okay, sorry. So there are seven best practices which have been uh, highlighted by uh, the uh, IUCN and uh, for restoration of lakes. Uh, so the first, uh, like, you know, I would just quickly go through all these uh, activities which should be considered or practiced while we go ahead with wetland restoration. We should restore wetland for multiple purposes, not just like suppose wetland is only for drinking water. We should not just restore it for drinking water. It also provides other multiple benefits. So all the benefits need to be considered. We should create a proper restoration plan. We should know what kind of habitats to be restored, what will grow in these wetlands, and how do we make these systems as self-sustaining and also monitor the progress of interventions. Then uh, community involvement, very important. Stakeholder engagement, community involvement, because they are the one who will help us setting the goals for restoration. Because without setting the goals for restoration, you can't even measure the impact of any social or technical intervention we make for restoring uh, these uh, fragile habitats. Uh, we need to address the sources of degradation. Why did this degradation is happening? What are the sources? Uh, again, the restoration effort should be to restore native flora and fauna um, because, again, we know that how invasive can invasive flora and fauna can just destroy the, these critical uh, habitats. Clean up the de degraded area and also structure access to wetland. It means that there should be a, a selected areas where you allow certain kind of species to survive without any human interference, certain kind of fauna to be there without any uh, human interference. So have these very structured uh, places which are accessible to only these kind of, uh, uh, of uh, particular kind of species. So, um, yeah, so this is like, you know, the introduction part. And now I will quickly um, walk you through the work which we have, we have been doing in Hanegra Lake, how we are taking into consideration all these seven best practices to develop a restoration plan for uh, a restoration of uh, Hanegra Lake. Yeah, we'll go for the next presentation. So this is a part of a lightning talk, so I'll just quickly finish it off in three minutes. So uh, as you all know, this is the extreme, Belandu Lake is an extreme example of uh, wetland degradation, fire and foaming in the lake. Everybody has witnessed these kind of events. And a Hanegra Lake is kind of following that kind of path. Most of the lakes in Bangalore cities are kind of following that path because of all kinds of developmental activities which are taking place. Then the question is like, how do we go ahead and restore these uh, fragile ecosystems? So Hanegra Lake earlier historically provided multiple benefits in terms of irrigation water for fishing, for groundwater recharge, multiple benefits. But over the period of time, you can see um, on the right side, the lake has been degraded and it's like, you know, completely eutrophied. So again, following the similar path as Belandur Lake has followed since the development activities have started. So what are the drivers? Uh, for, for this change in Hanegra Lake. So this particular map shows the catchment and how the catchment has kind of 
became uh, from rural to urban and at present 80% of the area is urbanized in the catchment. As a result, you see a lot of wastewater being entering into the lake. So uh, according to our estimation, it's around 20 million liters of untreated wastewater, both industrial and domestic, which is entering into the lake and contaminating the lake with various kind of like, you know, heavy metals and other stuff. So what is our approach towards restoration? So we started this particular project is funded by HCL uh, CSR and uh, we <clears throat> started the first thing was the community engagement and talking to stakeholders, talking to stakeholders, understanding what their concerns are and what they want this lake to be restored for. The second thing was to develop social economic and uh, water quality baseline, water quality and biodiversity baseline, baseline for this particular lake to understand that when, so what is the current state and when we do the intervention, how we will, it will be able to assess the impact of intervention on all these three components. Uh, and then we identified what are the drivers of change, which was again the part of baseline where we looked um, at uh, the, the different sources of pollution, what is the load coming in, what is the amount of water, like, you know, wastewater which is entering. That's how I came to this number of 20 million per, liters per day. And then once we understood the baseline, the next step is to come up with the restoration plan. So under this restoration plan, we are kind of developing and designing nature-based solution using native population. The, the, the role of nature-based solution is, of course, the 20 MLD of wastewater cannot be taken, like, taken care or treated by these nature-based solutions. So we need sewage treatment plant, which will be a part of restoration plan. But as you see in Jakur Lake, there's a lot of algae. So we need to control nutrients. And for that, we say that yeah, nature-based solutions with native vegetation would be something which we should try and test. So that is the next phase which we are planning to do. So this is the kind of also um, uh, linking back to the seven best practices which have been identified by IUCN. Thank you so much. I hope uh, I didn't. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we'll have Nobin, a PhD student, presenting his work. Okay. Hi. Uh, today I'll be talking about using environmental DNA as an effective approach to monitor and monitor the distribution and impact of invasive alien species. And uh, so just to give an idea, environmental DNA is the DNA that just goes from you and enter the uh, system. So in this case, we're talking about aquatic ecosystem. So if you're a fish, you're going to leave your DNA by shedding your shells or by defecating and probably giving birth to young ones or eggs, or probably when you die, the DNA also gets into the water. So you can use that DNA to identify and also assess the impact of the fishes. So I'm going to explain how. So to before that, so I think most of you know what invasive alien species is and what the impact that it has and all. So at $300 billion loss every year and all that things. But uh, you can use eDNA to understand the diet of invasive alien fishes. So you can actually take the gut of the fish and extract the DNA. And you can see what and all the fish has actually eaten in the last time that when you caught. Also, you can also uh, understand the microbiome assemblage in the gut to also explain why this species is successful in the water body. Because if you are going to be an invasive species, you are going to be in many places, different, different type of food, different type of environment. You have to have a really good gut microbiota to digest various types of food. So that also explains the invasive success of the fish. And uh, then in terms of monitoring, you can do species distribution. You can find whether the species is there or not. You can also do that for multiple species in the same time using next generation sequencing. And also you can assess the density, like how much amount of DNA per how much amount of species. And uh, you can also detect rare invasive alien species if the invasion, the earlier stages of if you know, one, or two, one or two fishes just enter the water body, you can still detect those things. And uh, you can also do restoration assessments. Like after you restore the water body, you just wanted to make sure there is no invasive species is coming in and all these things. All of this will work for any species you want to work in the water body. But in this case, I'm only focusing on invasive fishes. Yeah. Yeah. So we just did a pilot scale study uh, with the pilot technique. 
and uh, this is malavali lake in karnataka and uh, we sampled for gambusia species and uh, we wanted to know what the fish eating in that lake so i took out the fish and the fish gut has dna whatever it eaten that day morning because it's a diurnal fish so it caught in early morning and then you can isolate the dna and then you can go for uh, next generation sequencing in this case we use something called nanopo sequencing yeah which is also a technique that we tried out and uh, so this is how the typical results looks like i'm not going to walk through any of these things but just i just made this in a hurry but the understanding is that you can actually find a different profiles of dna present in the gut and also you can see one of the limitation is that you will find most of the host dna also because the gut is made up of the fish dna so there are ways to reduce that error also so this is just a preliminary results but you can find that you can find frogs dna and other insects and uh, even other fishes also because this fish is known to predate on other uh, tadpoles also uh, frog eggs also on other fishes eggs yeah some of the eggs are economically important fishes and so on and uh, this is a bacterial community assemblage in the gut so this will only make sense once you start comparing different landscapes because then only you will understand why this microbiota has to be in this gut if, of this fish for it to become successful in that water body so when, once we start comparing the different locations then we can come to that conclusion but this is a preliminary data so i'm just showing what the edna can tell about a biological invasion in wetland ecosystem which is one of the most vulnerable compared to other ecosystems right yeah and uh, yeah so yeah so the understanding is that we have to standardize the techniques and uh, the diet can be understood when comparing different landscapes and also you can also understand host parasite interaction because the some of the invasive species also bring parasites inside the water bodies which can be lethal for other native fishes so you can understand what parasite living and in the uh, fish and how it can spread to other places and so on it's also a very good tool for general biodiversity assessment of all kind in in water bodies yeah and uh, the future studies we are going to use the same technique in a larger scale where we are going to look at a lot of ramsar wetlands so this list is based on august 2022 because they had a lot of wetlands so but according to this list we are trying to look at selected water bodies we are going to look at uh, different type of fish assemblage of invasive wetland species fishes and uh, also we are going to look at the diets and how it is causing problem to those water bodies so that's it that, yeah. yeah thank you thank you uh, next we'll hear from rashmi mahajan sorry uh, so uh, so in uh, india and other parts of uh, world uh, community based natural resource management has been promoted uh, because state and markets were not showing the results uh, I, in case of management of natural resources and uh, in india especially in case of water uh, community based initiatives are generally uh, classified into three categories which include uh existing revival of existing traditional uh systems of water management then there are some uh communities which have laid the experiments uh of uh like their own their own uh management systems uh like hivre bazar i i think uh many of you must have heard about hivre bazar and then there are state led water management initiatives which include uh, participatory irrigation management and irrigation management transfer so uh, but uh, scholars have shown that many of these initiatives were based on a, a very uh, simple understanding that community is a, a homogeneous entity which is not the case uh, community is a complex entity and uh, there are lot of things which needs to be looked when we think about community which include uh, various socio cultural uh, factors and it include uh, we need to look into histories of those communities what are the local context understand the uh, class caste and gender dynamics in those communities uh, if we really want to understand communities better so uh, and also in if we are thinking about the uh, local water bodies or local water management systems uh, they are just not uh, like to provide irrigation they are also uh, 
to provide different non irrigation services uh, they support livelihoods like uh, fisheries and they also support local activities uh, so uh, we need to take all these things into consideration when we are focusing on management of local water management systems so uh, in my work uh, considering all these factors i am looking at how in institutions which work with these uh, water management systems work and what are the livelihoods dependent on that and uh, how uh, on everyday basis different actors interact with each other. So uh, I'm working in uh, Eastern Vidarbha region of Maharashtra. Uh, it's a state in central India. And uh, I in, in Eastern Vidarbha, I'm working in Bhandara and Gondia districts. So uh, I'm sure many of here we'll think that Vidarbha is a uh, region, drought prone region, which is known for farmer suicides. But this part of my, uh, Vidarbha is not uh, drought prone. It's actually uh, uh, resource rich in terms of forests and lakes. Uh, there are a lot of water bodies. You can see how uh, water bodies are distributed across the landscape. Uh, and uh, these water bodies are uh called maji malguzari tanks so maji malguzari tanks uh, the name maji malguzari comes from a malguzari system which is a system similar to zamindari and uh, malguzas which were who were revenue collectors during the uh, gond and uh, maratha period so gond and marathas ruled this area uh, and later british took over and uh, the system was continued for revenue collection and during this period of 300 years, uh, these tanks were built. So you can see the structure. So uh, these tanks have earthen embankments. And this is the gate through which water leads into canal. Uh, this is the overflow structure from which the wat extra water in the tank overflows outside so that uh, tank embankment doesn't get damaged. And this is how canals lead into farms. So this region, uh, produce uh, is mainly a uh, paddy cultivation area. 90% uh, of the area produces uh, rice. Uh, so, okay, thanks. So uh, farming and fisheries uh, are the main uh, dependent livelihoods on these tanks. And in addition to this, there are multiple small, small livelihoods. Uh, what happens is that there are multiple interests in, and these tanks, after uh, independence, Malguzari was abolished and tanks were, uh, tanks became the government property. So now there are three different actors uh, who are involved in tanks, tank management, farmers, fishers, and uh, government. So there are, and all of these actors have different interests in tanks and this causes conflicts between uh, the actors. So what I am trying to do in my work is I'm trying to understand the history and changes which have happened post abolition. I'm looking at the livelihoods and how so different socio-cultural and institution institutional factors affect the community-based water management and how communities are looking at the future of this system. So I have used mixed methods approach. Yeah, can I just finish it because just give me a minute. Okay. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Anamika. So, I um, request speakers to just stick by the time. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hello everyone. So my presentation is titled Navigating the Waters of Change, Prioritizing Wetlands of Chhattisgarh for Birds. It's on, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so uh, this is uh, a basic summary of the wetlands of Chhattisgarh. Uh, Chhattisgarh has around 1,66,000 wetlands and 0.2% uh, percentage only of that are natural wetlands of which there are river and oxbow lakes. And uh, majority of the wetlands lie below the size class uh, uh, 20 hectares. So uh, majority lies between 1 to 20 hectares. And within the uh, man-made uh, ones, most of the large large uh, wetlands are reservoirs and the smaller ones are tanks and ponds within the um, smaller size classes. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, yeah, this is uh, the distribution of wetlands within the state. It shows that most of the wetlands are concentrated within the central region of the state, which is also where most of the uh, human settlements as well as the croplands are situated. So uh, based on this, uh, we visited two of the wetlands in the central uh, central part of the state, which uh, were recommended by the wetland board. And those were Gidwa and Thor, which are two very different kind of uh, wetland uh, systems that we saw. So the first one was the Gidwa Parsada wetland complex, which is like a complex of four or five wetlands together. This uh, this wetland was actually declared as a um, as a bird safari or a protected area. And uh, after uh, after it was recognized that a lot of migratory bird species actually come to this wetland. And uh, this is a man-made wetland that's created around 30 years ago. So after they started protecting it, there has been no kind of uh, human activity that happens in that uh, wetland. People earlier used to use it for a lot of domestic uses and such. But now there are uh, it's not allowed at all. There are two uh, guards who protect patrol the area and also like they also do periodic bird monitoring and things like that. People are generally in favor of this protected area, uh, but uh, they also wish for some designated areas to do their domestic uh, uh, activities and there have also been promises of wetland development given to the local people which have not yet been fulfilled so when we went there we actually saw around 6000 individuals of ducks and uh, there were around 13 species which were migratory ducks which we saw there um, and the other wetland which we visited was the Thor wetland it was situated a little more closer to human habitations and a little more closer to industrial areas and uh, the city of Raipur. So this wetland is um, actually again a man-made wetland and it was created around 40 years ago. So the people in the village uh, work in the nearby industrial areas and there are some factories also along the wetlands and some railway tracks which run along the sides of this wetland. And this is like a typical village wetland. There are a few like very small shrines or temples built uh, along the side of these wetlands, uh, this wetland. And uh, there's no, it's not protected uh, as such, but actually people from that wetland prevent other people from coming there and hunting. And, uh, but even then they say that biodiversity has decreased. Uh, and this wetland is actually uh, quite used by the people. So they collect lotus stems and flowers and uh, they soak their grains inside before uh, sowing it in the field. And uh, when the water is dry, the children play cricket inside the wetland. And we also observed a large number of people like coming there and bathing and washing their clothes and vehicles, etc. So when we went there, we actually saw just uh, resident duck species like the Indian spotbill duck, around 150 individuals we saw. So uh, based on these two, and also to conclude, uh, around 99.8% of the wetlands of Chhattisgarh are man-made wetlands. And uh, the so-called protection activities may benefit the bird species, uh, but at the same time, it kind of alienates people from uh, their own village wetlands, which they had been using for so long. And uh, later, we will be characterizing the wetlands and the surrounding habitat and anthropogenic uh, drivers to explain the variability that we saw in the bird diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Anamika. Uh, next, we'll hear from Rashmi Kulranjan. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be talking about my work on uh, 
modeling urban lake systems uh, using the case study of uh, Bangalore's cascading lakes. So uh, basically, I started explaining how the system works. So these were uh, the tanks in Bangalore or lakes in Bangalore were originally built uh, as a system that is connected to each other. Basically, the lakes uh, were designed in a way that when the rainwater fills up into these lakes, the excess water would flow into the next lake. And all of these lakes are connected to each other through stormwater drains or uh, locally known as Rajakaluis. Um, so with time, what has happened is these connections have sort of been modified. Uh, there are new connections that have come into the system. For example, nearby areas release their sewage into the lakes directly, or there are uh, industries uh, releasing effluents, or uh, there are STPs or sewage treatment plants that release uh, treated water into these lakes. Or in many cases, the uh, connections have also been lost. For example, if there's a diversion that is created for preventing sewage from entering, uh, uh, the uh, network, the drain to the lake would have been uh, blocked. Or if there's an encroachment also, the connection would have sort of been lost. Uh, so what happens in these lakes is uh, there are a lot of uh, inflows from different sources like sewage or effluents. And all of these sources sort of bring in nutrients into the lake. Um, these nutrients may, uh, if, if uh, present in excess amount, may lead to, in many cases, algal blooms. And um, if that, uh, that may also result in anorbic, uh, anoxic conditions in the water. And uh, in the news, we have a lot of, a lot of times heard about things like uh, fish kill, sudden fish kill during dry seasons and stuff. The other uh, thing that could also happen is when the connections are lost, there is no way for the water to flow in the no natural path. So it may lead to flooding in many regions, which has also been common in many uh, news articles. Therefore, it brings us to the uh, uh, issue that it is important to understand how do these lakes function, both at an individual level as well as as a system, and what are the cascading effects of each of the uh, different changes that are being brought into this system. So for this, what we have been doing in our project is, one is we started monitoring these lakes by installing sensors at the outlets of these lakes. So these sensors basically measure the amount of water level in the lake, telling us how much water comes in and leaves the lakes. The other thing we're doing is also analyzing, doing water quality analysis. One, we take probes to the uh, field and do uh, measurements of uh, different water quality parameters in the field. The other one is we bring samples back to the lab and uh, analyze the uh, water quality parameters. Now, both of these flow measurements and water quality analysis helps us understand the inflows and outflows to the lakes, both in terms of the water that's coming and leaving and the nutrients that are coming and leaving. Now, this process uh, helps us gather data, which can be then modeled uh, to predict how do the systems function under different uh, conditions, changing conditions of both environment as well as human-induced conditions. And uh, why we say this uh, project is important is one, since we are monitoring these lakes, it can act as early flood warning systems in case we know that the water level goes above the cap uh, maximum capacity of these lakes. The other one is nutrient management. By knowing how much nutrients coming and leaving, uh, we could make decisions about how to manage uh, the nutrients and reach the desired level what stakeholders would want. And the most important is for stakeholders to make decisions around these lakes who are the most uh, 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 important uh, people making uh, these management decisions because if uh, in the model they can uh, put in what interventions they want, they could beforehand predict what would be the effect of the intervention that they want to bring in. For example, if they want to bring in a, a new STP that releases water, what would be the effect on the lake on the system? Or if there's a diversion drain, what would be the effect? So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I'll be going next, so give me a second. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you all for attending this program on the World Wetlands Day. So today I'll be just talking briefly about the uh, uh, Miristika swamps that I work in and why they're so fascinating and require uh, study. 
So the uh, Western Ghats, as you all know, is a global biodiversity hotspot. And in this hotspot, there are a myriad amount of ecosystems. And among these ecosystems, we have a lot of wetlands. Uh, we have rural ponds, stream systems, lakes, and then we also have swamps, uh, both mangrove or estuarine swamps and freshwater swamps, which are known as miristika swamps. Okay. Yeah. So this is what a typical miristika swamp looks like. There's a little stream that flows through it. And there's typically a lot of uh, swamp uh, or water tolerant vegetation. So typically the soils are very acidic in swamps and there's stream flow year round. There's perennial water supply. And there's also uh, heavy water logging because the water table is very close to the surface. So what we see is a lot of the plants have developed adaptations to reside in a swamp in, uh, in a very uh, wet environment. Uh, so they also are home to a wide variety of biodiversity. So we can see, uh, you know, there are many species of amphibians, including the dancing frog, which uh, Madhushree talked about in SAS. Uh, we have the lion tail macaque, which is one of the seed dispersers. We have hornbills, uh, giant squirrel. Uh, we have the um, flying lizard, uh, Draco genus and we have uh, wodonets which are also indicators of health riparian health and of course uh, reptiles like snakes and one of the most fascinating things actually about these swamps is that there are two species of trees that are from the miristicaceae family which is why they're known as miristica swamps and these two trees are called swamp obligate species because they require swamp environments in order to survive they require those soil conditions they require that perennial water supply in order to survive. And these root systems, as you can see, are part of the reason why they're so well adapted. So these knee roots, uh, as seen in the bottom photograph, and stilt roots, as seen in the top photograph, uh, enable the plant to uh, breathe or respire above the water water surface. So the, while the roots might be inundated, almost inundated during the flood season, a few lenticels or uh, like pores on the roots are actually able to uh, be above the ground, above the water level. So, however, these swamps are, while they are relic forest patches, which means they're un relatively untouched, they are now no longer safe because of rapid land use change in the surrounding landscape of the Western Ghats. So, some examples of threats to the swamps, I mean, we have eco budding ecotourism and trails in the forest. We have roads that are right beside many swamps. That's Katlikan, uh, the swamp in pictured, and there's a signboard to the swamp right next to the road. Um, so it's very accessible to the public. Then we have direct extraction of water for irrigation and domestic use, as well as the rise of areca plantations bordering swamps. And this is because areca is a water, it's a, it reduces a lot of water. And so it's very convenient for farmers to use drain swamps and use that land to plant areca. So actually a few farmers I met in my recent field visit even have started planting areca trees in the middle of the swamps because they say eventually the areca will push the swamp trees out and it will benefit them. So the thing is, we really need to, is that a three or five? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so we need to understand the main threats to swamps in order to better conserve them. So in order to do that, I'm following a process called threat mapping, which was a, a protocol set by Tambat in 2012. It's a way to understand the relative importance of different threats. And all swamps are really not equal. Some are very small, some are a little larger, but even the largest are like one acre, one hectare in, in size. So you can imagine these are really small fragmented ecosystems. There's also the thing of use value, which is, you know, using it for water and, ex and um, NTFP collection and the cultural value. Some of these swamps are sacred. So the villagers might view it as the God is giving them provisioning, which means they have the right to access the forest or they view it as outsiders cannot enter, but they themselves who go and worship the deity may enter the forest. So there are all these different things that come to play. So we can't grade the threats equally across swamps. We can't say all swamps are threatened by Arica because some are sacred, some are not. And communities may conserve, but they also may encroach, right? So how do we tread this delicate line between uh, what is a threat and what is actually a conservation measure? So in order to do this, I'm trying to look at conditions for key species regeneration in swamps. So the Miristika trees that require water year round and they require high soil moisture and they require the seed dispersals, which means Hornbills and macaques require a dense forest cover in order to move. So we need to maintain that forest cover. We need to maintain the water source throughout the year. We can't have the water diverted for plantations. Otherwise, we'll be losing these trees. So in order, basically, that means that uh, swamps are under threat and they're, very, they're fading away rapidly. So this kind of work hopefully will shed some light on the threats and how to save them.
So up next, we have Gauri. So today I'll be speaking about how satellite radar data is used to extract uh, seasonal water bodies is and uh, this is used for health applications. As we can see, Shumoga, Wainad and Sindhudur, three beautiful landscapes, which are a part of Western Ghats, uh, are very beautiful, uh, very relaxing and uh, a beautiful time to spend the monsoon season whereas these three study areas are associated with the Kaisenia forest disease or KFT most commonly called as as most commonly as it is called so the uh, KFT is more KFT is a tick-borne disease is which is uh, prevalent in summer season and it is transferred to uh, humans by the tick bite so during summer season, what happens is the so during summer season, what happens is um, the water bodies shrink or disappear, which provides a pathway for these ticks to migrate from one place to another. So it is very essential for us to extract water bodies to study uh, the tick movement and to uh, map and to and to provide early warning system for this uh, for the spread of this disease. So, uh, but extracting these water bodies is a challenge. So, uh, as we can see here, the image, the Landsat data, uh, which is an optical image, uh, as is covered by cloud during the monsoon month. Whereas, uh, so we uh, used another data, that is the Sentinel-1 data, which is obtained from a radar sensor. And these radar sensors can penetrate through clouds and provide us a cloud-free data. So these, so this data set helps us to help us to extract water bodies throughout the year. So uh, we tested four methods. They are the manual Otsu Valley emphasis and the Bayesian method. Uh, and these results were tested uh, against the field data obtained. And we found that the manual approach was the best and it was very accurate. Further, we compared that data with the JRC global data set obtained by uh, obtained by obtained from the landsat 8 data which is an optical data set provided by the european space agency we can see that the sentinel 1 data uh, as uh, extracted the smaller water bodies inundated paddy fields also whereas the grc data has extracted very little water body and we can see here uh, the grc water body is uh, covered by cloud in uh, during the monsoon season this is a july image and we can see that uh, it is covered by cloud and there are scan line errors which is prevalent in landsat 7 data and uh, here in this graph we can see that um, the area of water bodies from sentinel 1a are the black bar plots and then the gray bar plots are the jrc data and the gray triangles represent the cloud cover so when there is no cloud cover Sentinel 1A has extracted more water bodies or equal amount of water bodies is uh, as as the JRC has extracted. Uh, but during the monsoon months, like in August, we can see that um, uh, Sentinel 1A has ex extracted more water bodies, but uh, the JRC data is completely cover covered by cloud. The yeah, these uh, extracted data about uh, these extracted water bodies are. Uh, are fed into models to map disease spread uh, and it helps to allocate health resources to tackle outbreaks and uh, it helps uh, and it also identifies inundated paddy areas and these uh, water bodies can also be used uh, for flood mapping analysis of water spread dynamics and uh, analyzing seasonal variation of water bodies too thank you thank you next we have shri ranjini Um, hello. So um, 
So I'm Ranjana, a PhD student from the Environmental Sociology Lab, and I will be presenting on the topic Plural Valuation for the Conservation of Moya River of India's Western Guards. <clears throat> So um, just to, to give a background on my study, because I'm just starting on that work. So uh, we all know how uh, rivers are really important for civilizations. We all know how large civilizations originated around rivers and people draw a lot of values from rivers, ranging from everyday sustenance to extracting things like sand. And also uh, rivers are places where livelihoods are performed and they can be used for transportation from logs to people. And also in a country like India, we associate a lot of cultural, religious values where we consider rivers as sacred and we have a lot lifelong association with rivers right um and of course rivers are not only important for people but rivers are also extremely important for biodiversity a lot of organisms carry out their entire life history within uh flowing freshwater rivers and they depend entirely on these rivers and for them to be flowing for them to exist and um, not only the river stream itself, but also the riparian vegetation on its banks. A lot of uh, wildlife depend on the trees and vegetation that grows along these rivers, right? Um, but of course, also we know that we, especially in the last half a century in the Anthropocene, we have been using rivers extensively. I mean, we've always been using them, but we've modified them extensively in the recent past. Uh, both uh, in terms of river morphology, where we have constructed large dams, we have straightened out rivers to reclaim the land for agriculture. We have also been dumping a lot of untreated waste right into the river, which has affected both the quantity of water that flows, the quality of water that flows, and the habitat that's available for life in the river. And uh, not only are we affecting rivers, rivers are also affecting us quite a lot. Like we have huge floods that are causing a loss of property and lives to people. So the, the point here is that we need to look at rivers or we need to manage rivers for the, the plurality of values that can flow from them and not only for one or two values. Like uh, presently river management mostly is around hydropower generation and water for irrigation. But we also need to recognize that rivers produce a lot of other values. For example, rivers have huge values in uh, flood mitigation. The flood plains, if we don't convert them or you know, dam the rivers, then they can mitigate a lot of flood. And uh, rivers can also transport a lot of sediments, which are extremely important for them to reach the estuaries because a lot of wildlife depend on estuaries for carrying out their life history and supporting marine livelihoods. Yeah, And also the fisheries uh, that that the freshwater fisheries also support millions of people, both livelihood and their nutrition. So our current management is not as actually ignoring many of the values, both for wildlife and for people. So my question would be, can plural valuation inform river management for conservation and environmental justice? That would be the overarching question of my work. And I would be asking this question uh, of the Moya River that flows in Tamil Nadu. So this is a tributary of Kaveri. It flows uh, across the districts of um, uh, Nilgiris and Irod. And uh, Moya River is really still well known for its capacity to support a lot of wildlife. So we find here uh, many wildlife that is completely gone in the Kaveri Basin, but it's found only here. Like, for example, the orange fin Mahashi, the smooth coated otters, muggers, all of them still have a good stronghold in Moya. Um, Moyar also is, uh, I mean, along Moyar also live some of the particularly vulnerable tribal groups in Tamil Nadu who depend on these rivers and who have a long association with these rivers. But also Moyar is, uh, Moyar has around 10 dams built on it. And so the flow variability, the flow of the river is extremely controlled. So I would be studying two model systems, the fresh, the fish community and also the people and see how the fish ecology people and the hydrology is interconnected and how that could inform river manage for management for more than just hydropower generation for conservation, but also for justice. So yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Sumita. Hello, am I audible? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today for today's session. So I'll be giving a quick uh, run through about the work that is being done to look into how aquatic plants can be used for monitoring urban lake water quality. So oh. 
sorry so the problem statement is that how can aquatic plants be used for monitoring water quality so the approach here is that uh, to look at plant forms aquatic plant forms so broadly speaking they can be categorized into four groups submerged basically plants which are found completely inside the water and they tend to be found in clear transparent waters moving on you come across uh, floating leaf plants these are plants which start emerging in slightly turbid water then you come across emergent plants these are plants which tend to grow along shorelines like lake or river shorelines and in highly turbid waters uh, it's more common to find free floating plants which are found floating on the surface of the water body so using using these different plant forms we want to find out how they can be used for predicting and monitoring water quality so the coming to the methods specifically so we carried out plant survey and also water quality analysis for 10 lakes around bangalore city uh, we carried out surveys at uh, different lakes uh, using uh, 100 meter stretches and then taking surveys between each of these uh, stretches across a, uh, across a lake so for example in this lake we have three such survey stretches we have equidistant points and at each point uh, we used a one meter square quadrant and uh, noted down the different species and how much area they are covering, uh, percentage area they are covering within these each quadrants. Uh, here, I, there's some of the data that was collected. The fieldwork was carried out by Rakesh and Monica from the Water Lab. Uh, we find here uh, four, sorry, four different lakes. And for each lake, we see different uh, degrees of plant presence and um, we see them shifting from emergent to floating. What we're trying to find out here is that given that we have data on these plants because they're easily monitored, you can just go to the lake and note down. We want to see how well they can predict the water quality and whether the water quality is shifting based on how their abundance and diversity is changing. And coming to a quick overview of the results. So 13 species were observed across 10 of these lakes. These are these species. Uh, the most common forms that were observed were emergent and amphibious. Uh, these are some of the most common species noticed. Another important thing to note is that given that these are urban lakes, there are human activities going on. So a lot of deweeding happens. So that's also something to take note because we might miss uh, sort of confuse between plants which are responding to water quality and rather they are responding to human activities. And this is a quick overview of all the different species that are found in all the lakes. The next step is to actually link this and see how well they respond to water quality specifically. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Sneha Shahi. Hi everyone, my name is Neha and I'm a PhD student from the 2021 batch. However, today I'll be talking more on the lines of my MSc dissertation, which led to the conceptualization of my current PhD work, which I'll be talking to you all uh, tomorrow morning at 11. So coming back to the case study, this work was done from December 2019 to March 2021. Next. Yeah, so it started out by looking at a stream which flows through the university, which is the Maharaja Sayajira University. Vadodara is a small city in Gujarat, and it has a lot of rivers and small streams and wetlands connected to each other, which are a habitat for mugger crocodiles and soft shell turtles. Um, when we started looking at the stream, it looks more like a gutter, which is the case with most of the water bodies in India. When we are talking about wetlands and rivers and restoring them, we need to understand that they are all linked through rivulets and streams. And in managing the bigger water bodies, we also need to look at the smaller water bodies that link all of them and you know maintain an ecological flow between all of the water bodies. So understanding the history of how the particular stream or a rivulet or a river became so, how did the stressors start applying so much pressure that the natural resilience just couldn't bounce back is very essential. For which the project team, which was me and some of my juniors, started mapping out a lot of crocodile nesting sites, water quality, soil quality, sediment profile, and then a lot of surveys to understand the health profile of the people who live in formal and informal settlements along the river. 
when we started out with the water quality sampling we also made sure that we understand the water quantities because of the waste lodged between the bridges and along the stream the water quantity might not be as high but it leads to a spillover which leads to a lot of flooding this causes opportunity lack of opportunities for informal settlements and they have to move to other places similarly leading all the crocodiles to move into the cities Having a crocodile found in your locality in Vadodara is not news to anyone, and uh, it's something that people have accepted and moved on from. However, these crocodiles don't have enough fishes in the water because of the water quality, which is degraded to an extent that the DO levels are zero. So they have to rely on dogs, which are roaming around, or on birds. So again, like a lot of discourses can come out of this. Uh, then coming back to the waste part of it, so the team decided to have a cleanup, and based on a three-hour cleanup with 700 volunteer with 300 volunteers, we were able to remove around 700 kgs of waste, uh, compared com comprising of plastics, thermocol, bulk wastes, chemical bottles coming from the university itself. And this cleanup was only done in 0.5 kilometer stretch of the 7.5 kilometer length of the stream, because the rest of the 6.5 kilometers is under the municipality jurisdiction, and they did not want students with no funding whatsoever to be taking care of a stream which is technically their own backyard. So we went with the approach of a lot of bioengineering structures along the stream for reducing the erosion, having habitats for the crocodiles, and not just cementing along and channelizing the streams to make them look aesthetically beautiful and restoring them. Moving on, we, uh, along with 20 volunteers from the Department of Architecture and Civil Engineering, deployed all the bioengineered solutions along the stream. And later on, we observed that the waste was still flowing, so had an education module made and a lot of dissemination in terms of social media, news, informal and formal articles through the university's magazine was done. This was all done over the span of two years, which was during COVID. And later on in March 2021, we saw that the flows are sustained and the stream is much more cleaner. There's a long term monitoring plan in place for the stream. Uh, after I moved on from the project, my juniors have continued to monitor the stream and take care of it. Thank you. These were the people who were supporting. Thank you. you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Anushri. This is bringing us to our final two speed talks, so just sit tight. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so hi, I'm Anushri from the Mollusk Lab, and I hope everyone here is aware of the new trend going on snail beer. No? Okay, I think Priya forgot to mention in the beginning that uh, we have some snail beer testing to, to taste on the atri terrace after the, this event, is it? I am I am just kidding. This is to just to grab your attention. I am here only to talk about mollusk and wetlands. Okay. So I'm I'm going to talk about why mollusks are interesting and why do you need to conserve them and study them. So freshwater mollusks basically are uh, soft-bodied uh, aquatic animals and they are divided as snails and bivalves. Bi bivalves are further divided as mussels and clams. And if we look around overall India, uh, there are more than 200 species of freshwater mollusks found uh, together for gastropods and bivalves. Yeah, so these are found in various habitats starting from the stagnant water bodies to the flowing water bodies, stagnant water bodies such as uh, ponds, wetlands, and uh, there are very peculiar uh, snails which are confined to stagnant water bodies. And then there are some uh, special snails which are found only in the hill streams of the uh, forest. For, for example, uh, the Brochia species, the Pila mizoramensis, which we discovered uh, in 2019, I guess. And then there is this Polydomus species. And then there are some uh, specialists in this group, uh, which are called, uh, which belong to the Cremnoconcus genus. This genus is the only genus uh, belonging uh, to the uh, genus which has invaded the freshwaters the entire family is from marine ecosystem and these uh, small snails they are confined only to wa uh, waterfalls of karnataka and maharashtra 
and each waterfall harbors a unique species of this genus. Then there is another unique uh, freshwater snail called as uh, the freshwater oyster. This was recently re rediscovered in 1996 after 100 years and it is confined to uh, very few patches of the Bhadra River in Karnataka. Uh, so, freshwater snails also uh, provide us with various ecological services such as uh, they form a very important part in the food chain and they uh, are the prey base for the birds like open bill stalks and then there are bi uh, bivalves which act as biological indicators. So, muzzles are known to purify the water, so 20 gallons of water they can uh, purify in 24 hours. And then they also uh, give economic services such as their the, uh, muzzles are widely used in the button industry and decorative items and also uh, manufactured pearls. Uh, most interestingly, mollusks are used on a very wide scale as a food resource uh, in uh, coastal regions of India as well as uh, there is a very large market of, for, for these in the northeast of India. And there are, and we have uh, noted around 18 species of freshwater mollusks being eaten in the northeast of India. They are all also used in the pets, uh, in the aquarium as pets. And recently there is a boom in the cosmetological industry, uh, which is going crazy with the snail mucin and uh, snail moisturizers and face sheets and face masks, masks and whatnot. Uh, coming to research, as they have limited mode of dispersal, they are widely used to study phylogeny and uh, bio biogeography of a region on a global scale. And the main threats in uh, for these mollusks involve damming, uh, over harvesting, uh, habitat degradation, and uh, pollution. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll hear from Sminu. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today I will be present on the topic role of plants in constructed wetland. So the, here the problem statement is, should we pay more attention to plant species selection in constructed wetland? As you know, constructed wetland is an engineer system that optimizes various process in the natural wetland to treat wastewater. Uh, the plants aggregate materials and associated microorganisms are the indispensable component of the constructed wetland. Plants play a crucial role in treatment of the wastewater in the constructed wetland. Uh, the roots that helps in filtering pollutants uh, and the plants also help in velocity reduction of the wastewater that will help in the sedimentation and it provide attachment site for microbial microbes that helps in the removal of organics and the nutrients. Then the plant roots that release carbon and oxygen that helps in the removal of nutrients and it also regulate the micro microclimate. Apart from this, uh, the plants provide habitat for the wildlife and provide ecosystem services. And other ecosystem services. Um, so considering all these, uh, the selection of plants in constructed wetlands has uh, constructed wetland design and um, management is very important. So this is the Jakur constructed wetland. Uh, Jakur Lake has uh, integrated wetland system which consists of STP, uh, constructed wetland with macrophytes and algal ponds. So the treated, secondary treated wastewater from STP that is uh, discharged into the wet, constructed wetland, there it's purifies further before discharge into the lake system. So from the thorough literature review, we understood that different plant species have different nutrient removal uh, efficiency. So with respect to this, it's important to, um, uh, uh, it is important to consider the role of plants and species selection in the constructed wetland. So um, in a tree water lab, based, uh, as part of my research work, uh, I am optimizing the plant type in hydroponics to understand uh, the nutrient removal efficiency among different plant species. The plant species selected here are uh, canna lily, uh, 
cypress papyrus and typhalatifolia and one tank will be the mixture of polyculture system which consisting of all these three plants one tank will be set as control uh, so this is the reactor setup. The study will be conducted in hydroponics. The system will fill with the synthetic wastewater, which has the characteristics of secondary treated wastewater from Joko Lake. So this is the flowchart for the uh, uh, experimental design. The plant species uh, number will be selected here six, and uh, the water will be replaced in the tank every 11 days, and the water analysis will be done for uh, nutrients, especially ammonium nickel nitrogen, uh, total nitrogen, orthophosphate, and COD will be estimated every 11 days, and the plants will be uprooted, and plant growth estimate rate, uh, growth rate estimation will be find out. Seasonal variation on the nutrient accumulation in different parts of the plant, roots, stems, leaves will be estimated chlorophyll level also be estimated so the expected outcomes are determine the plant type effect on the constricted wetland nutrient removal develop and propose design principles that incorporate plant characteristics especially the plant type plant density and harvesting into consideration for tertiary water treatment thank you thank you So thank you all so much. So thank you all so much. We've taken exactly an hour of your time. So now we ask for two minutes more. We're going to show a two minute short animated film on uh, called Testing, Testing Still Works. She said it better than I did. And uh, yeah, it's just showcasing a little more of Atri's work. Uh, thank you all. Testing still waters. Bengaluru, once dotted with lakes and water bodies, boasted of lush avenue trees earning it the name the Garden City. Today, it has become the city of burning lakes. How and what caused this transformation? To answer this question, Atri set up a lab to monitor the water quality of lakes. Jakur Lake, one of the biggest lakes in the city, has recently had several instances of fish kill, algal bloom and bird deaths. Atri regularly monitors the water quality of the lake, including checking oxygen levels and pH values of the water. This helps us track the condition of the lake and identify anomalies. Chemicals such as heavy metals, pesticides and pharmaceutical residue can cause disease. Monitoring the dissolved oxygen levels in the lake has helped us answer questions about fish and bird kills in the lake to some extent. This has further led to implementing better management plans at the lake. We also examined water flow and assisted the sewage treatment plant in monitoring the treatment processes and its impact on water quality. We work with several stakeholders to design comprehensive solutions that ensure water recycling and local reuse. We believe that the adoption of solutions regionally will help us achieve larger goals on a national scale. The Jakur power plant required treated water for its cooling towers. Atri looked into the impact of this action on the lake health. The lake requires 7 million litres per day to maintain optimal water balance. The extraction would jeopardise the lake's balance. Through our research, we are integrating various elements, biodiversity, community perceptions, livelihoods and water chemistry to develop case-specific comprehensive water quality standards. The benefits of nature-based solutions to address water quality issues are widely known across the globe. However, the lack of design principles is one of the key barriers to scaling up these solutions. At ATRI, we are devising experiments to develop design principles that will help scale operations and maintenance of nature-based solutions. Thank you all for being here today and celebrating World Wetlands Day with us. Uh, yeah, I'll just give it to Dr. Priyanka. So what an enlightening, enlightening talks is uh, uh, were there. And uh, I really thank everyone, each one of you who made, taken efforts to present their work. 
and also everyone who attended this uh, event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.